virtual is better than not at all, although remarking a poor substitute. And we're going to hope that next year it is so different and we are all together. Although I don't know that we would have gotten all these people in Tim's house. This is being recorded, our gathering, so that we will be able to, you can share it with someone. We're probably going to put some highlights up on um, our social media after this event. You are muted, but during the event, you can hit that little chat button at the bottom of your screen and you can chat um, with us. You can ask questions of our panelists and you can chat with one another. I always tell people when we do these, if this were a real community event and we were in person, you would see someone you knew and you would probably like sidle over to them and have a conversation. So if you see someone that you know and you wanna send them a direct message, by all means do it. We have fabulous guests, but that should not stand in the way of your connecting with one another. Um, oh, one more thing. So there are two, what they call views on Zoom, which you may know probably up in the upper right hand of your screen, there's a, a little word that says view and there's a speaker view and there's a gallery view. The gallery view will show you everybody who's here, all of the boxes, and you can scroll through the screens and see people who are, who are with us. And if you wanna see who is speaking, you put yourself on the speaker view and then whoever is talking is going to be front and center for you. Um, so that is all the housekeeping we wanted to do. The theme of tonight's celebration is the impact of art, culture, and design in Black history and the programs that are shaping future generations. We also figured you could sort of invert that and call it the impact of Black history on art, culture, and design. And before we get to our wonderful guests. There are a few people who wanted to say hello to all of us, starting with Mondaire Jones, United States Congressman from New York's 17th District, which includes parts of Westchester and Rockland County. Uh, he sent us a message today, so let's listen to it. Hello, everyone. This is Congressman Mondaire Jones, and I am so honored to be with you all virtually to celebrate Black History Month. This month is an opportunity for us to look back on the history of our nation and honor the trailblazers who have shaped future generations. When I reflect on the black history makers who have inspired my work and my journey to Congress, I think of folks like Thurgood Marshall, Bayard Rustin, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many more. In each of their careers, they were trailblazers, leading the fight for racial justice LGBTQ plus equality, voting rights, and so much more. While we honor the work of these leaders, this month is also about remembering those who didn't end up in the public eye, but nevertheless inspired and shaped those around them. For me, I think of my grandfather, a janitor who grew up in Jim Crow, Virginia. When he walked a dirt path to school, white kids would spit on him as they rode the school bus. 50 years later, his grandson is now the first openly gay black member of Congress. I miss him, but I know that I'm honoring his legacy every day, fighting for the racial justice that my grandfather and so many like him deserved and working to ensure that everyone can walk to school and live in dignity. And as we work to achieve racial justice and dismantle systemic racism in every form, education must be part of this fight. From early childhood learning to higher education, I'm working to ensure students of color are set up for success and that they can thrive inside and outside of the classroom. It's why I co-authored the Universal Child Care and Early Learning Act with Senator Warren so that no cost is a barrier to early childhood education. It's why I've introduced the Strength and Diversity Act to integrate our public schools and further the process of desegregation. And it's why I've called on President Biden to cancel $50,000 in student loan debt, which continues to disadvantage an entire generation of young people and disproportionately burden black folks. As a proud member of the House Education and Labor Committee, I'm proud to be a leader in the fight for education equity, and even more proud to represent an incredible 
minority serving institution like Mercy College, which is leading the charge for more equitable success in college. This Black History Month and every month, I'm grateful for Mercy College's passion, perseverance, and partnership as we work to affirm racial justice and honor the legacy of those who came before us. Thank you so much. Also with us, who I can see in one of these boxes, although you should feel free to wave too, George, is Westchester County Executive George Latimer. There he is. George, would you like to say a few words? Thanks very much. I appreciate the chance to say hello. I'm looking forward to the program. Um, I grew up in Mount Vernon, white boy in an African-American neighborhood. And when I went to school, elementary school, junior high school, the history that we were taught, American history and world history, I look back on now in retrospect and I realize we were taught white history. We were taught the history of Europe. <clears throat> we were taught the history of America from the standpoint of those that came from England. Uh, and uh, that was what American history was. We realize now that history is much deeper and much richer. And the role that African-Americans have played uh, absolutely critical to the formation of this country and to the world. And so now we've got some catching up to do, and I wanna honor an educational institution like Mercy College under the leadership of President Tim Hall that understands that we have that catching up to do. <clears throat> we have to tell the story of black Americans uh, as well as the story of white Americans, of all Americans. And in that effort, I salute you. And we're certainly partners in that effort. Thank you so much. Um, we wanna recognize also some other um, folks who are with us tonight, Viviana DeCohen, Director of the New York State Division of Veterans Services, a Mercy alum, a Mercy professor, head of our Veterans Affairs um, Office at one point, and much beloved at the college. Uh, the Westchester County Legislator, Mary Jane Chimsky. Mary Jane, I saw you, you could wave there, there you go. Um, Westchester County Deputy Executive, Ken Jenkins. Ken, if you were there, you could wave and show everybody where you are. Um, Andre Early, who is the commissioner of the Westchester County Department of Parks, Recreation and Conservation. Andre, I believe is also a Mercy alum, I think, I think. Um, and Westchester County Legislator Jewel Williams Johnson from District 8 is with us. Crystal Collins, Director of Policy and Programs and Faith-Based Initiatives and Urban Affairs for the Office of the Westchester County Executive, George Latimer, and Alyssa Jacobs from Tom Abenanti's office. Are you with us? Okay, we're gonna keep going and we're gonna hope that Tom comes back on um, to join us. So rounding out all these fabulous people, last but certainly not least in all of our hearts is our president, Mercy College, our Yes, our president, uh, Tim Hall. Tim? Thank you, Edie, and welcome all of you this evening. I want to join in recognizing one other person, and that is a member of our board, Valerie Cunningham. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I get to work with Valerie all the time because she's on our board, and I'm glad she's been able to join us tonight. I'm regretting that we're not at my house, uh, mostly because I'm regretting the uh, lack of wine and any appetizers, but we'll just have to manage uh, until next year where I hope we'll be back where we normally are for this event. I want to talk with you about something that I learned about 20 years or so ago. That was when the first of my children was about to head off to college and I was struggling to pay the tuition bills. So I signed on to write some reference books for a big New York publisher called Facts on File. And the second of those three books was a reference book about famous American religious leaders. And of the 250 or so leaders I wrote about, the one I still to this day remember most vividly was a black religious leader and educator named Fanny Jackson Copen. She was one of the first African-American women in the United States to receive a college degree, and she became a leading American educator of the late 19th century. Ms. Copen was born a slave in 1837 in Washington, DC, but she had an aunt who was able to purchase her freedom when she was 10 years old. And during her teenage years, she was able to use her earnings from a job to pay for one hour lessons from a tutor three times a week. I, 
I have a hard time imagining my children using any of the money that they earned from part-time jobs to pay for private lessons in academics, but that's what she did. After some additional schooling, she eventually became a student at Oberlin College, which opened its doors to black students in 1835 and to women in 1837. Even as a student at Oberlin, she opened a night school for freedmen who arrived in Oberlin at the beginning of the Civil War, and she became a student teacher at Oberlin. She graduated in 1865 and was named class poet. While she was at Oberlin, the famous 19th century urban revivalist Charles Grandison Finney was the college's president. After college, she moved to Philadelphia and accepted a position that would make her famous in uh, 19th century America as the principal of the female division for the Institute of Colored Youth in Philadelphia. In 1869, she became the head of both the male and the female divisions of the Institute, and that was a position she would hold for more than 30 years and from which she would lead the Institute to become one of the most prestigious schools in the country. I won't add further details to her long and distinguished career as the head of the Institute of Colored Youth, but I will write, relate an incident I've never forgotten, and she described it in her own in her own words about her early years in Philadelphia. So this is what she said. I had been so long in Oberlin that I had forgotten about my color, but I was sharply reminded of it when in a storm of rain, a Philadelphia streetcar conductor forbid my entering a car that did not have on it for colored people. So I had to wait in the storm until one came in which colored people could ride. This was my first unpleasant experience in Philadelphia. Visiting Oberlin not long after my work began in Philadelphia, President Finney asked me how I was growing in grace. I told him that I was growing as fast as the American people would let me. It's no surprise that Charles Finney would ask Ms. Copen about her growth in grace. Christians still to this day sometimes use that phrase. Then and now it tends to be understood as the individual spiritual progress of believers who follow Christ. Although Ms. Copen stated the point gently, she reminded President Finney that the American people, including not a few Ms. Copen should have been able to count on as brothers and sisters in Christ, had not always supported her in her growth in grace. Those words have lingered in my mind ever since I first learned about Ms. Copen. I was growing in grace as fast as the American people would let me. Now as the president of New York's largest private nonprofit minority serving college, I regularly think to myself, what are we doing to let our students grow as fast as they are able? And are we doing everything we can to not stand in the way of their growth? During college years, institutions of higher learning like Mercy tend to refer to the growth and positive outcomes of our students as student success. One of the most important aspects of student success is retention. That is, the percentage of freshmen who don't drop out but return to become sophomores the next year. If I were giving you this speech about, say, 12 years or so ago, I would have to admit that Black students at Mercy were not being as successful as we might have wished. Less than a half, 47%, completed their freshman year and began their sophomore year, as compared to closer than three quarters or 69% of white students. Today, though, I'm happy to tell you things, that, though not complete, are much different. A worldwide pandemic, unfortunately, has challenged the retention of Black students for the past year, but for four straight years before that, Black students were retained at rates higher than any other students, especially white and Hispanic students. For four straight years before the pandemic, white students in particular have dropped out anywhere from five to 10% more than Black students during or immediately after the first year. And in case you wonder whether black males or black females were retained at the highest rates of all, they each split the honor, two years and two. This isn't the end of the story though, we're well aware, either for our students or for the college, we have more to do to support the growth of our students, more to do to make sure that we don't stand in the way of that growth. But here's what I can tell you as president, who believes in them absolutely, who's confident that they are hope, the hope and future of America. When we support them, when we make sure we don't stand in their way, they soar. They're like the young Ms. Copeland growing up 
just as fast as America will let her grow. So I wanna thank you all for joining us to celebrate black history and the students here at Mercy who will one day make black history of the future. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. And now at last, I am told reliably that Tom Abenanti is on with us. So Tom, there are you, I see you. If you could wave so that everyone who sees all the boxes can know where you are. Would you uh, like to say a few words? Yes, I would. Thank you for letting me join you. I apologize for being late. I was coming down from Albany. We, uh, we had session today uh, and I needed to get down here for a couple of other events. I'm sorry I can't be joining you in person. I, I recall the days when I was able to come over to the campus and, uh, and, and, me, and see all of you without those little square boxes around you. Um, but I, I do very much appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to visit with you today. Uh, you know, the, the history of um, America is, is, is writ by uh, people of every race, color, religion, uh, national origin. Um, and, but unfortunately, the history books that are supposed to accurately record that history omits so much of the contributions that black Americans made to our community. Um, you know, community is not just the place on a map. It is the whole of its people. It is the spirit, the character, the culture. And it's, we don't understand that real character of our community if we leave out of the history some of the people and the contributions that they made. So it's really important that we understand what Black History Month is all about and let our other community members understand what Black history is all about. It's important that we understand those people who came before and understand the challenges they faced and the contributions that they made. And it's also important that we recognize those today who are carrying on their message and are contributing to our community. The, let me just end by saying, together, we need to use Black History Month to unite everyone, to inform everyone, to spur action, to create lasting change where we are all together. As someone said, we are stronger together. We got to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Thank you for letting me join you this evening. Thank you, Tom. Um, another member of our board of trustees is with us, Greg Williams. And Greg, you are someone for whom I wonder um, if Black History Month isn't especially poignant in some ways, Greg is the author of the book, Life on the Color Line, the true story of a white boy who discovered he was black. So Greg, thank you for being with us. Would you like to say a few words? Okay, uh, th thank you, Edie. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really uh, uh, pleased that Tim and the Mercy staff has undertaken once again recognize Black History Month because I think it is very, very important. You know, um, one of the things about my book it took me around the country um, and I had a chance to talk with people across the country about issues of race and racism in their communities. And unfortunately, virtually every place that I toured from New York to Los Angeles, and across the country pointed out to me issues in their own communities that they were still confronting and had been confronting for years. So it's really great that we continue to recognize issues that they're as current today as they were 50 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. I just, um, I need to make one correction, by the way. Andre Early is actually the deputy county commissioner of the Westchester County Department of Parks, Recreation and Conservation. I gave him a little promotion there. So, um, all right, to our first speaker, who many of you will know, 
Sarah Bracey White, and she has many, many, many facets to her life. For 30 years, she has served as the Executive Director of Cultural Affairs for the town of Greenberg. She is a much published author of books, poetry and essays, and a contributor to a literary performance group. She is a devoted cook of Southern food, and we're gonna come back to that in a minute. She is a former dress designer who actually, when she was growing up, designed uh, dresses for her own Barbie doll. And for those of us of a certain age, um, you may be interested to know that when she was growing up, she wanted to be Barbara Walters. I found that terrific. So um, Sarah spoke to one of our classes last year, um, Black Lives Matter in Art, and she told them, and I want to share with you, she had a specific message for all of us who think uh, we could never be artists. She um, had some things to say about creativity. Take a look. There are various parts of our lives that are intertwined simply by our living, by the things we're interested in. You ask people, are you creative or are you talented? And they always stop as if thinking, well, do I paint? Do I? No. Do you get dressed in the morning and put together an outfit to come that's appropriate for you and for where you're going? Do you ever have a plant in your house that you water and nurture? Do you make a meal? Do you go to the store and figure out how to put things together when you go home to make a meal? All of this is creativity. I think making gravy is the most creative thing I do. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome to you, Sarah. Would you wave to Sarah Bracey White just so that the people who have the gallery view will know where you are? And I would encourage all of you to put the speaker view on now as Sarah um, talks to us. Hi, Sarah. Hi. You know, Edie, this is um, an unusual African American History Month celebration. I think that what Mercy College is doing is putting steroids on this whole principle of inclusion. And I think that it's very important. Um, I never thought of myself as creative, even though I've always lived a creative life. In childhood, I did not grow up in a house in South Carolina where there were pictures on the wall. I read comic books. In the back of a comic book, they had one of those contests that said, if you can copy this, send it in and we'll give you a scholarship to an art school. I drew it, sent it in. When the salesman showed up at my door, my mother said, I can't afford to pay this salesman and send you to an art class. So I became the child who was a jack of all trades of creativity. I tried to grow things. I tried to sew. I made cookbooks for my mother for Mother's Day. All those things were an expression of who I was. I am a creative person. What I discovered when I went to a historically black college in Baltimore was that a liberal arts college required us to take art appreciation. I was bowled over when I was introduced to the world of fine art. And I, my visits to the local museum in Baltimore just opened my eyes to things. And as you can see in the background of my office, the walls of my house are covered with pictures, nothing expensive, but they are pictures that I like that express my area of creativity. I grow plants. I still do these things that are important. I've been fortunate in that my work with the town of Greenberg has allowed me to use what I know to help other people express their creativity. Um, Westchester County has a 14% African-American population. I meet a lot of those people in the town of Greenberg. And what I've done is I went out into the community and asked people, what do you want? Prior to my getting this job, the director of arts and culture presented musicians and speakers and all of those, but they were things that residents came and watched other people do. One of the very first programs that I did was a program where I presented people from the community who knew how to do something that they had never been formally trained for. I had a man come in carving bars of soap into little animals. I had a man who turned his back on the audience and played the guitar, singing songs his mother had taught him that he had never sung in public. It made me realize that within these people, they had all these needs and desires and 
they wanted to share it. I did a program called Black History Before Your Eyes for African American History Month. And I invited people from the community, bring a photograph of someone on whose shoulders you stand, who gave you what you know. People brought all kinds of pictures of family members from basketball players on. And for me, I think that when we talk, I've listened to people talk about who they've been impressed by in their lives. I never knew my great grandfather. I was 40 years old before I did enough family history research to tell you the story I'm gonna tell you. My great grandfather was born into slavery. By 1900, my illiterate grandfather owned a thousand acres of South Carolina land. This man who could not read and write, I found the deeds to property. I found in his will where he sent two of his daughters and two of his sons to Allen University in Columbia, South Carolina. These are things that show you the potential. And in my family, the idea of education is instilled through him into the next generation and two beneath me. These are things that show man's desire for education and desire for creativity transcends everything. If you look at historical movies that we're seeing and shows that they're seeing, after slaves were emancipated, they were fighting to get educated. They wanted to learn to read. They wanted to learn to write. They wanted to do this and they began to share it. You look at Phyllis Wheatley, who's one of the first African-American poets in here. And you see that we've been doing all these things, but this is not stuff that's taught in school. But I find it fascinating when we bring the past into the present. We don't just focus on who the past people are. I can tell you that the town of Greenberg has undertaken a project as a part of the Black Lives Matter um, pro program we are in the process of doing a almost $80,000 outdoor mural that is a um, museum in the street. It is being done in Greenberg where 287 crosses over the cross over Manhattan Avenue. It is an under the um, structure that's being painted on the stone sides. They're 225 square feet on either side. We're bringing in Wi-Fi so that the historical figures who are on this, you shine your phone on a QR code and go into a Wi-Fi set on a website that teaches you all the background from, it's an educational thing, but it is art. It is being done by kids from schools. Woodlands High School just created the last of four large banners that say all lives can't matter until black lives matter. They are being placed around the town of Greenberg along with signs like that at the same points where it's welcome to Greenberg. So we're reaching out into communities to say, these are the things that are going on. And it's really funny because the high school students who've been working on this have turned up at various public affairs and talked about how it impacts their life and their feeling in the arts. So it's schools like yours that make it possible for people to take this initial love of creativity to a place where they can make a living with it. I never thought I could make a living as a writer, but I have discovered that with a job like mine that allows me creativity, I'm a consultant to the town of Greenberg. It allows me enough freedom to have written the story of my life in South Carolina, which I am shocked by the number of people of all races and all ethnic groups and all cultural then sexes respond to the book and talk about how it informs them of what the African-American life was in a small South Carolina town where there was strict segregation during the 40s and 50s when I was growing up there. Um, I could talk forever about so many things, but I wanna um, keep the program going and I wanna let, um, Edie asked me some questions and I welcome questions from the audience, but the telling of our story must be done by us. I'm a writer because a writer said that to me. And when I told my story, I had no idea it resonated with so many people. It was simply a small story, but it was a story that changed me. 
And it allowed me to grow beyond the confines of a Jim Crow upbringing and move into a world where I felt I could attach myself to anything important that I wanted to do and succeed at it. Sarah, I wanna ask you about something that we um, uncovered as we were doing research on this topic of uh, black history and art. It was, the, it was an article in the Washington Post and we're gonna put up the headline and show people what it says. And you talked about making a living. Here's the headline. If you're lucky enough to earn a living from your art, you're probably white. And then deeper down in the article, it had some statistics to um, sort of flesh that out a little bit. And so here they are, nearly 12,000 artists working in the US today, 83% of whom are white and 4% of whom approximately are black. And I'm showing this not to be a Debbie Downer in um, our uh, Black History Month celebration, but to ask you, you are the living, breathing embodiment of the fact that it's possible to break through these odds and do something. So for young artists, how would you say they should, they should be, become noticed and, and, and get on our radar? I show artists in Greenberg's five galleries who've never shown before. I get people who bring me their relatives to show. We talk about the process of curating a show and getting them visible to people. Um, white artists don't always make a living at art. There are some people who are good enough to jump that line. Blacks have an especially hard time because we aren't an equal representation of the population in all the fields of art, even in design, which is what the kids here at school are really getting so much advantage about. Um, when I saw that statistic at first, I wasn't surprised. It will take direct effort. And I think that the protests after George Floyd died made people start thinking differently about equity and the uh, opportunity that Blacks actually had in America in doing these various kind of things. It is a country of opportunity, but what happens is people in the higher levels tend to have their vision of how these things should go. And if you don't fit that vision, you don't get invited into the organizations. Um, artists get noticed when they're different. You can't just be a realistic artist who paints really good portraits or whatever. Nobody will buy it but the actual subject of it. There's an artist in Greenberg, Vinnie Bagwell, who is a um, sculptor. If I had the money, I would be her patron. She is so good, but she spends so much of her time seeking commissions that she doesn't have as much time to devote to art. Yet what she has done is she has set up a website and photographers show her in the process of creating her work. They talk about where she's gone and how she's done things. And she talks about not getting all of the um, opportunities that she applies for simply because there are so many people vying for these very same things. So I have no real answer other than time is changing and those numbers are greater than they were 50 years ago, 50 years ago, Tanner, the painter went to Paris because he couldn't get blacks. He couldn't get anyone to teach him to paint in America. He became an expat and stayed in Paris where he was accepted. And you now see his works in museums and they talk about his value. I would like the world to reach a point where people like him can that number will rise and they will be able to be recognized for their talents. Yes, without having to go overseas. I'm just curious, when you're curating an exhibit, how do you spot talent? <laughs> what are you looking for? Um, first of all, I don't curate by having people submit to me and I choose. My feeling is that by the time somebody comes to you and says, I wanna show my work, they have censored themselves for years because so many of them come to you thinking I'm really not that good, but 
I like this and my mother says it's nice and I want to try. If you're willing to sign your name to a painting, you can come to me and get on a list and get the first opening in one of the galleries. I offer, I call it, this is a community opportunity. I am not vetting artists. I am giving the artists a chance to improve their lives by saying I've shown in a gallery. And I often will do, um, I will help artists in how to exhibit and how to frame and how to do the background things, how to write a press release for it, how to write an artist statement. But I get people who have shown all around who just want their work seen by people in the community. All right, I, I could keep asking you questions forever, but um, there are a couple more people now that we wanna let, let say hello who have joined us. Um, first is Valerie Mason Cunningham, who Tim mentioned, a member of our board of trustees. Valerie, would you like to say anything? Uh, thank you, Edie. I, I am just uh, in awe with uh, what Sarah and you were just talking about and um, remembering a lot of uh, trials and tribulations I went through. Um, I was a part of the Malvern School District out on Long Island when we were going through desegregation in that school and um, remembered my parents' strong willingness to push through to make sure that those schools were integrated. And so this is very important because what you need is an opportunity. Once given the opportunity, like anyone, we work really hard. Everybody works hard when given an opportunity, but when you have people that also see things in you, like Sarah was just saying, is so important. So this is such a great opportunity that we're talking about. And it's important for everybody to just take your little blinders off, take your different shades off and really open your eyes because if we just look at each other as just looking at each other, there's beauty inside of all of us. So thank you for allowing me to just have a few words. Thanks, Valerie. I also wanna recognize, um, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Lola Brabham who is in our audience. She's with the Commission on Independent Colleges and Universities. Did I pronounce your name correctly, Lola? You did, thank you so much. Um, I didn't expect to be recognized today, but I definitely <laughs> wanted to join the Black History Month celebration. Um, I'm enjoying it. I am uh, happy that, that you're having it. Um, and, and particularly in this format, um, you know, at this time in the pandemic, really there's been so many activities and, uh, planned activities that that couldn't occur. So I'm happy that Mercy College has chosen to move forward with this. And hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. And um, Sarah, I neglected to mention, but want everybody to see you are the author of a new book. And we want to show everyone the cover of that book, Primary Lessons. And uh, you want to tell us about it a little bit? Primary Lessons is the story of the 12 years I lived in South Carolina. When Blacks were migrating out of the South, my mother refused to leave. My father, who was a school teacher, was blacklisted from teaching because he refused to give the names of the teachers at his school where he was principal to the school superintendent when they attended an NAACP meeting. And the superintendent told him if he didn't give the names, he'd never teach again. And my father, whose whole life had been teaching, was blacklisted and never taught school again. My mother sent me to Philadelphia because I was the youngest in the family and not old enough to go to school to her older sister. I stayed in Philadelphia until I was five. I grew up a free child who was listened to, who was um, allowed to learn things and do things. At age five, my mother reunited all of her kids in South Carolina and I was exposed to the Jim Crow era. I was an angry five-year-old and for 12 years until my mother suddenly died, I lived in Sumter. So this is the story of how I went through that and the primary lessons I learned and how I would not kowtow to the belief that I was not as good as anybody else in Sumter because it had been put in me as a child by my aunt that I was as good as any person, probably better. 
So this is that story of the time from I'm five until I'm 17 when I graduate from college. And that picture was taken two weeks before my mother died. That was my debutante cotillion. And she died two weeks after that in my life kind of was in upheaval. So the next book deals with that. But this book came out in 2013 and it's available at the Village Bookstore in Pleasantville. I have copies that I autograph and sell. You can buy it on Amazon. But um, it's interested a lot of people and it continues to sell, which surprises the small publishing press who picked me up when I won a contest for the best entry of all the submissions when they had a call for memoirs to publish for the first time. Well, I am not at all surprised about that. So for those of you, we're gonna show her book cover again at the um, end of our time together, just so that um, if you wanna get a chance to write that down. Uh, now we wanna introduce you to a Mercy alumna who actually we met at last year's Black History Month celebration. Her name is Dominique Jones, and she is a book cover designer at Penguin Random House. And she was a design and animation major at Mercy College. She graduated in 2018. And in the absolute best spirit of how Mercy College graduates pay it forward in life, she is the creator of a website called Black and Brown Book Designers, which she is going to tell us about. Let me introduce Dominique Jones. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, before I dibble dab into Black Brown Book Designers, I'm going to take it back a bit and just talk about how I got into design. Um, so it pretty much started off in very small forms of being creative, whether it was drawing in my notebook or playing with my hair or styling myself in random crazy outfits. It was a way of self-expression. As I got older, I went to John Dewey High School where I was then introduced into Photoshop and that opened my eyes into a whole nother world. From there, I wind up being at Mercy and starting off as a freshman, I felt like I wasn't the best drawing major at all. So Mercy actually allowed us to have these courses where we could take and it pretty much challenged me and also made me very comfortable in expressing myself, whether it was drawing or learning about type and just learning about design and colors. And it just exposed myself into learning about so many other designers and artists that I've never would have known about. And from there, it actually gravitated towards my interest into books, which started off as a small little book design project that you do in class and really don't think anything of it besides getting an A. And from there, I found out that it's something inside of me that sparked every time I picked up a book or went inside of a bookstore and just felt the paper or looked at how shiny it looked or all these crazy covers that some are funny and some are just so classic. And some part of me knew that I had to do this as part of my life, but I didn't know when or how. Fast forward into my senior year, I was had the opportunity to work at Penguin Random House, which is like one of the big publishers that everyone knows about. And from there, when I walked inside of that building, I knew that I found my home. And from there, I've been there for about three years now. And to tell you the truth, I love it. And I don't think I'm probably ever gonna leave until they probably kick me out or I retire. <laughs> and to start off, every day is pretty much a different experience. It's everything is, you're always learning something new every single day. And our projects, it always varies. In publishing, we have about three seasons, which is actually a fun fact for so many people. Um, and from there, we get a list of titles that we just work on on a day to day, which I work with an art director. And then we prepare up for our weekly meetings to present to the editors and soon enough, then the author gets to see it. You gonna show us some? Oh yes, oh, let me, okay. So here are some of my covers. To start off this first slide, this is basically a slide of debut novels. Um, and with debut novels, it's pretty much, you get to dibble dab into whatever, the author gives you an interest of what they like or what they don't like. 
And from there, we read the stories and plan out all these random sketches from five sketches to probably 10. And from there, the author chooses which ones they like. For example, the hierarchy's main focus was the main character. For When We Fall Apart was focused on the setting. And for Black Girl Call Home was also focused on the character, well, the author, but also just about her experience um, in race, feminism, and queer identity. On the next slide, we have what I call repackages, which are also very fun and kind of gives you a different taste where you can just do whatever you want, but also make it more modern and still relatable to the audience, but still bring in the new, new set of audience at the same time. For example, like A Raisin in the Sun and To Be Young, Black and Gifted are covers that I've drawn by hand. And for that, it was a focus on setting and person which is Lorraine Hansberry. For China Boy, it was based on a fiction novel of a young Asian American boy in San Francisco. So from there to make it fun, I just tried to do some sort of collaging that made it very simple, but also fun. And then the very top corner is actual photo of the author's, I believe, mother. And Another repackage is also fun sometimes. Sometimes I can't handle everything and sometimes we actually hire illustrators, which in this case, I had collaborated with an illustrator named B. Harris, also known as Brittany Harris. And she's a phenomenal illustrator. And we did the whole repackage for Tay McMillan and it was an honor working with her. In the last slide, there, these covers are pretty much so-called celebrity covers. And in this case, they're sort of simple, but not very much. In this case, we'll usually get a bunch of photo, um, photos from photo shoots or photos that the author likes themselves of them. And the main goal for that is to find a good composition with the, with the photo, as well as pairing it with type and color that pretty much complements it as a whole. So, out of all of those three slides that you've seen, it sometimes sounds easy, but at the same time, it also can be very difficult. And so in the last three years at Penguin, one of the things I would like to point out is that they have been very helpful in being in an industry that I have no idea what I was doing. It pretty much geared me into opening doors for others because I too was the only black designer in my team for a very long time and still am. And even though the industry and Penguin itself is also growing to be more diverse, I created what's called Black Brown Book Designers, which is a collaborative community of professional book designers. And it's full of resources, support, opportunities, all within the industry. Our main mission is to build bridges between the publishers and creatives in order to build more, diverse, more diversity and spread awareness of the publishing industry. And we're not just book cover designers like myself. There's also interior designers, marketing creatives, illustrators, so much more. And during this time, I would like to highlight for Black History Month is, is a time of celebration and empowerment and a reflection of what our ancestors had accomplished. And if, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. And if you would like to learn more about Black Brown Book Designers, you could definitely check out the website or our social media. Thank you. I remember when I met you, Dominique, you, you said that shortly after you got to Penguin, you just sort of looked around and said, nobody looks like me. Yeah. Right? I mean, but that was, I mean, a very, I mean, you're walking the walk. I think I, I'm so admiring of what you are doing to build bridges. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, well, if anybody wants to know about that website and uh, did not get a chance to see the URL, we're gonna show you that too, just as soon as we can. So Dominique, thank you very much. It's wonderful to go backstage and see your life and we wish you every success. Thank you very much. <laughs> when we were thinking about this topic, um, we were reminded actually of the wonderful painting original painting that was created for Mercy College by the artist Cynthia St. James. 
It is called Unstoppable. And we unveiled it at the opening, the, at the ceremony opening our new Mercy Manhattan campus. And it just captures the mercy spirit so well. So we wanted to show it to you. This is where I started 50 years ago as a professional artist, selling my first painting in Manhattan at 20. And I think this particular painting has more people in it than any painting I've ever painted. And I haven't counted them, but I think it's reaching close to 90 to give it, give, give it a feel of where it is. And Herald Square, which you'll know, and all the elements and the wonderful things about this institution. And chose the word, of course, unstoppable, because that's exactly what this place is all about. Everyone connected with it, students, staff. And you'll even see the all oh, packed in it. You'll feel the nurturing, I hope. For me, it was really researching the college, um, finding out what they offer, looking at where it's come from and what it is today, and uh, the diversity, definitely diversity, and also the diversity in age groups because of the master's degrees, and the nurturing feeling of the college leadership and staff. I hope it encourages them to go for it in life and really key in on that word unstoppable. And now we are so thrilled to tell you that that original piece of art is featured in Cynthia's newest book, which is coming out. I think it's a coffee table book. It is called HBCUs Capturing the Quintessence. Uh, HBCU, of course, being historically black colleges and universities. So we are thrilled about our friendship with Cynthia and we wish her every success with this book. And we always stop by that painting in our Mercy Manhattan campus, pause and regard it with great, great pride. Now, uh, two things. It is 5.59 and I want to be very respectful of your time. So we're going to go over our time a little bit. I hope that is okay with all of you. I just want to point out we, we are mindful of that. Um, and you, if you have to go, you have to go, but I hope you don't go. Um, we're now, we want to introduce you to a current Mercy student, a Mercy scholar, actually. Her name is Sakina Bell. She's going to graduate in 2022. She is also a design and animation major. She was a participant in the program Connect Four. Connect Four is all about networking for equality in design. It's a mentorship program for students of color that tries to help students find employment as designers after graduation and puts them on the path to become leaders in the industry who will shape the future of design and it pairs them up with mentors. And it's really remarkable, the program. And Sakina is remarkable. Hi, Sakina, can you wave to everybody so they can uh, see where you are? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, my name is Sakina Bell. I currently live in Harlem, New York. I'm a senior in the graphic design program. Right now, I'm also an intern on Michael's Beirut team at Pentagram. Very excited that I have that internship and learn, learning about different designs from different people. It's very exciting to me. Um, I've been through a lot in my life. So my creativity comes from my struggle with my depression and trying to find my way of focusing of how to focus my anger better. So growing up, my creativity, I did a lot of writing. And as um, technology got more advanced, like I got more curious to figure out how certain things was made and how websites was made, how posters was made. So I shifted my creativity from writing to trying to learn about design. I did my, I first dabbled into design in early 2000 and I got my associate's degree in 2011. And um, I'm 35 right now. So it's like when I got into Mercy in 2008, I was really intimidated because being the oldest person in the classroom and being around a bunch of um, younger students and seeing their talent, it made me want to up my game. And try. I also had to teach myself to stop comparing myself to others and not necessarily compare myself, but to try to be like them, or if not better. And um I've been one of the hardest working students in my class. Like I've 
full-time students, full-time jobs. So it's like, I've always been a go-getter and I don't know how to stop. <laughs> um, I, uh, Connect Four is actually a partnership um, with Mercy College, Sakina. And I wonder if you could tell us how important it is for colleges to offer programs like this and what was the thing you liked most about it? Well, I guess it's very important because like I did my, my associates at TCI and when I was at TCI, I didn't have any teachers or anybody that's telling me that's worrying about what I'm doing outside of my graduate program or even telling me that you got this. You're very talented. It wasn't until I got into Mercy's that I got my, my, my design professors and it made me feel so good as a person because that was the first time that I had someone tell me you got this. You're talented. Calm down. You got this. So to have Connect Four and to be able to be paired with these designers, that, that was amazing. My, my mentor was Forrest Young. He was the um, creative director of Wolf Olin's. Now he's the creative director of Rivian. And working with Forrest, like his mind is like so mind blowing. It helped me open my mind a lot. It helped me look at things a lot better in different aspects. So Connect Four is, one of the best programs I think I've ever been a part of. And if you all are interested to know more about it, we would encourage you to go to the Mercy website. Sarah, I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but I'm just wondering, Sarah Bracy White, you have any advice for this young woman? You know, it's one day at a time, but it's also preparing yourself so that when the opportunity presents itself, you're equipped to do it. I always complain about having to learn new things. Every time I learn something new that's difficult to do, in a week or two, the situation arises where because I know that I'm able to move ahead in a field. And it works kind of in all different areas. You've got to do the grassroots groundwork. Um, Jakita talks about she does her work. She puts in her work in classrooms. She's got the goods so that a mentor can't make you better. A mentor can simply guide you in what you're doing. You've got to do the work that you're prepared for a minute to help you. And your attitude, the business of going back and being older, you bring experience to the classroom that these kids haven't had. They're trying to find themselves. You know what you want to do. You just need somebody to point the way for you and to help you focus on getting to that point but your drive is what will get you there. Mm -hmm. Sakina, can you show us some of the designs you made for your class? Yes. So this was for my GD3 class, my graphic design class. This is for one of my branded projects. This was actually my favorite project ever because this was the first time that I did the entire project by hand. The project is done by weaving paper and then I scanned it back in. It was for... Uh, a film festival and the festival that I chose was um, the Black Harvest Film Festival. And the reason why I chose this festival in particular was because around the time of this um, project was also around the time of Brianna Taylor and Joyce Floyd. So it connected to me a little like harshly, really. So the colors stand for the sun and the blue was what we are afraid of as black people, which are cops. So that was my concept for my color combination. I also, I did this post that I also did on the next slide. I also did a Maya Angelou poster because growing up, I, like I said, I wrote a lot. So she's my favorite author to this day. And I took a lot of my inspiration from my poetry and my, and my stories when I was a kid from Maya. So I couldn't do a black history event without including my favorite person in the world. So Maya is there. <laughs> I also did a banner for this program, for this festival. Like I said, this entire um, festival branding system was done by hand. I weaved all the paper and scanned it back in. I did this post and I also did a brochure for the festival. And on the next slide, yes, the inside of the brochure. I wanted to keep the same color concept, even though I know the brochure is not by hand, but I wanted to actually, keep that same identity system going throughout. I did t-shirts, I did a bag, and I did apps. So yeah. 
this is like I said, this is my favorite project by far because this is the first time that I was able to work by hand and and it actually taught me that I actually love working by hand. So and you have to realize as as a design student that sometimes the computer is not going to always give you the answer. So you have to find your way to break out of the computer mode. Mm -hmm. I want to read to you a message that our board of trustee member Valerie Mason Cunningham put in the chat, which I'm sure you, you didn't see while you were talking, Sakina, but it says, Sakina Bell, you keep focused forward and growing strong. You are fearless, bold, and exactly what our world needs. Remember, quitters never win and winners never quit. And you are a winner. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope you will get connected up with um, uh, Dominique's website before uh, it's all said and done. We're gonna bring our program to a close, but I wanna tell you a couple of things. First of all, there is Sarah Bracey White's book, Primary Lessons, which is available. And there is a cover, the cover of uh, Cynthia St. James' new book, uh, HBCUs Capturing the Quintessence. So if you want to learn more about either of these, you can get in touch with us or um, you can find them, I guess, both of them on Amazon. And I also want to tell you, we're going to say good night to you, but we really, really hope this is not goodbye. It has been very meaningful to us to be able to see all of our community partners who were with us for this event. It is important to Mercy that we know you and all the good work you're doing. It's important to us that you know us. And so let's keep it going. Please keep in touch with us and let us know what you're doing. And we will do the same. We will keep in touch with all of you. And uh, last but not least, if you've been to very many Zoom meetings, you know that they are, for the most part, incredibly boring. Um, and it's very rare that we have the opportunity to share things like videos and book covers and graphic arts and PowerPoints and websites and all the things that we've gotten to share with you tonight. And needless to say, that doesn't happen without a lot of support. So I want to publicly and passionately thank, first of all, our IA team, that's Institutional Advancement, for their work and our IT team, Information Technology, for helping us put this program together that we could show you this evening. It was a lift and they soared and we are grateful up and down the chain here. So Laura, Jody, Sonia, Marcus, Camille, Todd, Christine, William, thank you so much. Sarah Bracy white Dominique Jones, uh, Sakina Bell, thank you to all of you. Thanks to all the elected representatives who joined us tonight and the members of our board of trustees um, who, who had great words of encouragement. We hope this is one of many um, celebrations of Black History Month that you all will enjoy this month. And we are going to hope to see you again soon. So thank you and have a good night.